we start uh, uh, this course, International Refugee uh, Complementary Protection, Migration, and Human Rights Regime. The course one. Um, the, uh, the lecturer is uh, uh, Judge Aramaki, uh, my longtime friend from New Zealand. Uh, in this class, not only the uh, regular students who are registered, uh, we also ask uh, special uh, resource persons as uh, uh, auditors because uh, he's also judge and be related with uh, exact practice. In this sense, uh, many practitioners interested and assisted for the, this course. So in this sense, we are happy to have them uh, the auditing and do, uh, well, participating, give uh, uh, sort of answer, uh, question and answer or comments or criticism and so on from the practical point of view. Not only the theoretical, but practical. Uh, this is a course idea. So in this sense, um, the, I want to assure for the free freedom of the expression in the context of the, uh, this educational event. So I would like to ask you be, uh, uh, to uh, govern by the so-called uh, Chatham House rule. How do you know Chatham, Chatham House? So that means uh, you will not to refer uh, inside uh, uh, these uh, uh, comments uh, anything uh, without a permission, uh, prior consent of the person who just commented. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, people will be a bit afraid to uh, be, uh, give us some uh, personal views uh, based on the, their positions, you know. So I don't mean, uh, I don't uh, ask any identities at this uh, stage, but you can also identify yourself or not identify. Uh, so this is up to you. Any questions? Uh, all right. So now I pass on. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Okay. Right, good evening and thank you uh, for all uh, your coming here today. It's uh, a great pleasure for me to be back in Japan and to be working with such an illustrious group. Um, Sato Sensei and I have known each other for more years than most of you have lived. Uh, 1991, 92 I think, uh, where he came and sat in the early stages of an appeal tribunal in New Zealand and migration and refugee matters when he was a UNHCR rep. And a young lawyer. A young, young lawyer. <laughs> and I was a younger lawyer <laughs> in those days. Anyway, uh, we're going to go through, to start with, um, refugee protection and uh, its linkages to start with, with human security, human dignity, and uh, then we'll go on and look at refugee law and the statement there that refugee and protection law is not migration law, I hope will become apparent to you. Let me give you Kiora nao mai, tēnā koutou katoa tu henga, ka whai mai e te ro. So, there's a language you will never hear in a refugee case. It is Māori and it is the welcome. So a warm welcome uh, from New Zealand and the privilege of addressing you all. And I leave the All Blacks who are here at the same time to do the haka for you rather than imitate kamati kamati kaora kaora, uh, the haka of Te Rapraha a famous chief in New Zealand who wrote the haka, that haka, that the All Blacks, one of the hakas they use, and uh, in about 1841, when he was escaping from the English who were going around taking over the country, uh, and he went on an island and he sat down and wrote this uh, haka, which basically is a warrior's haka saying, I live, I die, I live, I die, and, uh, it, uh, and I will be brave until the end and fight for my people. 
That's basically what it is that the haka's about, or that haka. They've got two hakas. There's another one, a recent one, which is, I won't explain, a little more difficult. Anyway, the next one. So, as you know, as a general topic, migration and refugee protection are what you might call hot issues. They are sadly, at this time, seriously dividing the world in so many countries. Uh, and, and you see it every day on news articles, even in Japan, Somebody died in a camp the other day. It's all over the news. Refugee claimants, the small number who are granted status here, becomes news. Uh, issues as this, this are daily. And of course, if you're in Europe, it's there all the time. And uh, Australia, all its problems are regularly on news in the Southern Hemisphere and around the world. And so it is an issue a big issue. It's across Africa. It's now across Latin America is a problem, Venezuelans. Uh, a certain Mr. Trump doesn't like refugees, doesn't like migrants actually by the sound of it. So he builds walls to stop them coming in or trying to build walls. Anyway, so it's a hot topic. And so it's sensitive. So in this class, let's be a bit careful in but we will use the so-called Chatham House rules. Chatham House is a, a, a building in London where many, many years ago, when they were debating difficult topics, they set down these rules for what's said within this room stays within this room. That's really basically all Chatham House rules. So I want you to be free to discuss. And uh, while I'm on that, the assessment for students will be partly based on your course participation. So if you've got a view, please say it. Don't worry if you want to interrupt when I'm in the middle of something. The classes are for you, not for me. They're for you, and they're for your benefit and for your accumulated knowledge. So don't be embarrassed. You won't embarrass me. I've been around for 75 years, so... Uh, <laughs> I've had a few problems and I've made a hell of a lot of mistakes in my life. So don't worry, just ask. So when we talk about related to this, uh, human rights, many people think either you are trendy lefties, as the term is, and it's all just a left-wing conspiracy, or they think it's just dry lawyers talk about treaties and convention. Let's hope they do think it's about treaties and convention because that's where most of it lies. But, okay, next one. Sorry, you've got a job there for life. Um, it's, uh, but there's far more to it than that. We should not forget the reality that within these very treaties, most of them are in this book. I don't expect you to read the whole thing by the time I've finished, but... Uh, that's just the basic ones. Right, the, um, they're the actual norms we all want to live by, when you think about it, and we'll be going through these. And, so, and every person is a unique individual. Everybody deserves their own human dignity, whether they're a baby squealing and puking in its mother's arms, as Shakespeare said, or it's an old guy, older than me, decrepit, and uh, with senile dementia. Every person is a unique individual deserving of human respect. Okay? So you don't just ignore some person because they're a different colour, a different race, a different background. You don't like the way they talk. They're an individual. So they have a right to life, asylum, access to justice, a whole lot of things that are in, starting probably with the UNHDR, as the UDA, UDHR, as we'll discuss later. So they're what we cherish, and they're what we recorded. After the traumas of World War I and World War II, particularly the lesson learned in between, 
that if you go and kill millions and millions of people, it's not a smart idea to allow more uh, regimes to build up that are actually worse than the ones that you just got rid of. So hence, after World War II, a lot of very wise people and representing states, not a bunch of trendy lefties or a people of pseudo-refugees, states got together to work out how to deal with displaced persons or persons in fear of future persecution by setting out treaties and going through them so that people could be protected from their inherent dignity and their inalienable rights and rights being taken away from them. So the UNHCR, uh, sorry, the UDHR puts recognition of inherent dignity and equal inalienable rights of all members of the human family, which we all are. So it's a fundamental freedom. Okay, so let's, and just while I, I will talk quite often about the, what's called the International Bill or the International Bill of Human Rights. You've heard of that before as a term? It's really the combination of the three. This, the human, and the ones, the 1966 ICCPR and the Economic and Social, ICESCA as it's called. So the preamble goes on. It's essential if man is compelled to have resource at a last resort to rebellion, tyranny, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. That's why I'm here as a judge. And I'm not actually a New Zealand judge, I'm a British judge, <laughs> which is confusing. A confusing person with several nationalities, and I've been a judge in the UK, a chairman of the tribunals in New Zealand, so you're not actually a judge, never mind. Um, so, whereas the essential is to promote the development of friendly relations between nations, just go on. So, disregard for human rights have resulted, this is the lessons of two world wars, barbarous acts which outraged the conscience of mankind, lovely words, and the advent of the world in which human beings shall share freedom of speech, belief in freedom, freedom from fear, and you'll see that word come up again soon, and want, and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. So we're right up here in the top things and top um, level of rights that people should be. Thanks very much. Okay, so then you get to Article 1. All humans are born free, equal dignity rights. Exactly what I was saying before about human dignity. Are now endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards each other in the spirit of brotherhood. There's nothing about which country you come from, where you come from, how old you are, whether you're male or female, whether you're LGBTIQ, whatever it might be. Uh, everyone is entitled to his rights to set forth in the Declaration, as it says, without all those, race, colour, sex, religion. Wasn't bad for 1948, was it? You would think this had just been written very close, just quite recently. You know, it, even the Me Too movement would be happy to write it down, these things. Okay, so... Without no, with no distinction made on the basis of political, international, jurisdictional rights or the rights of territory, etc. Okay? Thanks. The right to life and liberty is the article. Number three, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. No one shall be subjected to torture, cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. CTIP, as it's called, CDTPI, that's under the, now under the CAT Convention, a prime uh, protection beyond the Refugee Convention, we'll talk about later. Everyone has the right to freedom of movement within states and within the borders of their states. Everyone has the right to leave the country. Okay, next one, please. And what's this? Importantly, at Article 14, everyone has the right to seek and enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. So it's right there in the highest level of rights. That's why the Refugee Convention was brought into place and recognise 
that this was written at the same time as about 60 government representatives were also working on the Refugee Convention. Three years. For those of you who look closer at it, if you really want, you can read the Travaux, as they call it, the Travaux Pépertois, which is the French for the working documents that were fascinating documents to go through and how this whole thing was put together. Highly, highly intelligent bureaucrats from countries setting it up by states, for states. All right? So the right to nationality, so that, you know, to get avoid statelessness, all these things were thought of. Yep, can we go on? So let's look. The ICCPR was bought in in 1966, but it was worked on over the 10, 12 years after the Refugee Convention came in. And you can see it refers back to it, and it sets out about 16 rights, I think it is, in the Convention. And again, it goes back to the Charter of the United Nations, which is another core document in this field that promotes universal respect for human rights and freedoms. Thanks. Article 1 to 27, you should go through them and look at them. You won't see them that much quoted in refugee decisions, but basically in um, now, uh, certainly in Europe, all across Europe, um, as you come further east, places like Russia don't take quite so much notice, but uh, right through now the old stand countries, they are pretty much w using these, uh, these tech, this, this uh, basis for assessment. All of Africa, virtually all of Latin America, through another convention or a declaration, the Cartagena Declaration, which has more rights in it than, than the Refugee Convention. And so that the essential linkages of Refugee Convention come back to the concept of surrogate protection, being persecuted and serious harm. So we'll go through those in a, in a, in a moment. Before we do, just let me ask you, what do you think is meant by surrogate protection? Anybody got any ideas on what surrogate protection is? Do you know what surrogacy is? The English term surrogacy. What does that? Yep, somebody. Raise your hand. Just raise your hand. We'll just talk Don't about Don't be it. shy. Don't be shy. Shall I appoint you? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to? Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, tell me. Yeah, yes. Here's the mic. I yes. think the surrogate protection is like uh, the state have the obligation not just to protect you, but to ensure that you have the you able to live in that state that you seek the asylum or live in uh, with dignity, like providing you the shelter or food or those things to. Yes. Mm, yes, that's half of it. That's the protection that. But the surrogacy, surrogacy means standing in the place of someone else. So if I adopt a child, I become the surrogate parent to that child. That's what surrogacy is about. And this is state surrogacy. So if my state is not giving me protection... Other states have to. Yeah, it, it, if it, the state, yes, that's quite right. So other states, then, that's the right to seek asylum. So if you are in fear, well-founded fear, objective fear, not subjective fear, you wouldn't lodge an application if it didn't have... So that's the subject of part gone, which we'll discuss later. It, you are, have the right to go somewhere else and get away from being persecuted by your own state or non-state actors where the state does not take action to reduce the fear below that of what we call a real chance or a real risk, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, under, under the international law, the, this is a, you know, a diplomatic protection. If, if you um, have a problem in the, as a, some countries, you'll be arrested or some sort of a mm -hmm. kind of thing. So if you are Japanese, Japanese government have a right to intervene to negotiate with the country. Any question? Yeah, I have a question. I have two questions. Uh, so my question is, 
question is, um, we talked about the obligations of state protection. Are there also obligations on the other country for the Saudi of protection um, through the UAE and Iraq? Uh, are there, what did you say, are there obligations on the state that you're leaving, in other words? Uh, no, on to the state that you're going into. Yes, that's what the Refugee Convention is all about. And it is not just a definition, we'll come to in a moment, Article 1A2. There are another 44, 48, but the 44 that set out what, a set, set out a set of rights as to what you must give to those people when they are confirmed or declared as a refugee. Okay? Yes. It's a topic of, um, to the people who don't have the nationality. Yes, it's, it says, we'll come and look at that. The Article 182 talks about country of habitual residence. So if you are stateless, you can apply uh, for, on the basis of being, risk of being persecuted in your own, in the country where you have habitual residence. For example, if you, uh, still happens a bit, uh, Bedouins in Kuwait, for example, they will not give nationality to for strange historic reasons we don't go into. But they are effectively stateless. They will not give them travel documents and everything. So they have, they can be at risk of being persecuted and almost by give, making them stateless, refugee law is now at the stage where that is virtually equivalent to being persecuted because you can't do anything or go anywhere. Uh, the Rohingya is another example of that sort of thing. And there are lots of people you don't realise that you, they, uh, in fact, are living in that they don't have uh, a proper nationality. Or they've been there and they have another nationality because their parents took them there when they were one or two or something like that. Good questions. Very good questions. One more. Um, yeah, well, with, um, I'm going to try to about Oh, yeah, OK. In that people way, but um, so uh, with what you said just now, uh, you already answered 90% of what uh, I was going to ask. But so. Under the principle of surrogate protection, is it an obligation for well any third state, any third party, to give nationality to somebody who's been stripped of his nationality by his own state? So, for example, if a Rohingya refugee who doesn't have uh, citizenship in Burma uh, moves to a different country as a refugee, is that country obligated under um, international law to grant him citizenship? Uh, yes, it can be, but unfortunately, the whole international law relating to statelessness, which is what effectively has happened to the person you're talking about, has only been, oh, the numbers, uh, I think it's about 60 or 70 countries rather than 200 countries. Mm -hmm. It is, you're right, in customary international law, you're absolutely right, because the practice is big enough that countries should give long-term, not necessary citizenship, but a permanent right to remain in their country if they're stateless. And the UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees, has that responsibility as well of looking after stateless people uh, as well as refugees. And maybe later in the course uh, or the end of it, um, Sujin, my assistant here, who's been a UNHCR rep in Korea can tell you a little bit about statelessness if you did it under your bailiwick. I'm not sure whether you did, but and in the in the first of the second course, there is one or two people from the, the UNHCR coming here and I want them to talk about statelessness, particularly in Japan. But again, you're absolutely right. Statelessness is countries uh, sh are obliged both under under the statelessness convention, which I said unfortunately has not been that well signed, but uh, in, certainly in, in, um, uh, in customary international law, yes, to give them, to give them uh, some sort of status so they can be legal. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's move on then. So a good answer to that question. I loved it. So the, uh, as you know, the, these two conventions, the the C ICCPR was sort of the International Bill of Rights put forward by the West. This is in the days of the Cold War, remember. 
uh, and this is the other side. This is the east uh, putting up, which are more social and uh, social rights, employment rights, labour rights, but they're important rights from their side of the, of the bargain. So the two, that's why the two go together. And there are many articles in there that are highly relevant. And if you really get into refugee law, you will find that there are a lot of arguments now as to whether you can get to the level of being persecuted for b serious breaches of some of the rights in the ICESCA. And uh, there's, there's our Australian friend, uh, Jane McAdam, a famous professor in Australia, has written books on it, and uh, it is a growing area of protection. Okay. Now, just let's go on now, and yes, thanks, uh, next one. It goes back, this is not new, this started back in the 18th, in the 18th century, 17th and 18th century. Just, I don't know whether Mr. Trump's ever read this, but <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the certain inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, to secure these rights, government has instituted men to right the past. This is all just a slightly older version uh, of what's in the, in the UDHR. So rather strange that uh, he should be trying to run away from all this, uh, wanting to allow people to be killed with guns all the time, to take away their liberty, not to give them much happiness, certainly not allowed to go across the borders. Um, it's, uh, it's regressive and he should go back more than two centuries to see what his very country was founded on. Anyway, next one, thanks. And you'll see it's the similar things in the big ones first, like the European Convention, 1950. This was written sort of in parallel with the UDHR and the Refugee Convention. So they're talking about the same fundamental freedoms, right to justice, uh, efficient democracy, human rights. Hello, the words come again. And it, again, it is states writing this, not a bunch of left-wingers or pseudo-refugees trying to make it up. These are states who wrote it for themselves and their good governance. So they, the ideals, freedom, the rule of law. Ah, what a judge, the first thing you're sworn to when you're sworn as a judge, to uphold the rule of law. And that doesn't mean bad law, that means good law and international law such as this. Okay, thanks. So there it is, Article 1, Obligation to Respect Human Rights. Rights and Freedoms in Section 1 of the Convention. It goes through, and yep, keep moving. Articles 2 to, uh, 2 to 18, and particularly Article 2 is the right to life. Article 3 is the prohibition against CDITP, as we were talking about before, uh, against torture, right to liberty, fair trial, family life, Article 8. When I was a judge in the UK, we did many, many cases on to Article 8. And there can be breaches of Article 8 under European law that actually uh, entitle you to not being sent back to your own country to get your, if your ta family issues are going to be ripped apart. Moving from this largely European basis, including the Austra if you call the Americans Europeans, but uh, they speak one of the languages. Yep. Now let's look at the Japanese constitution. I know it might have been written with some American influence, but there it is. Desire for peace, deeply conscious of the high ideals of creating human relationships, determined to preserve security in existence, trusting jace, judge, justice and faith in peace-loving peoples, recognise the right to live in peace and freedom, and shall enjoy, hello, what's this word again? What's this little phrase? Fundamental human rights. It's even in your own constitution. So there you are. It's not escaped Japan. Guaranteed, guaranteed by this constitution and conferred upon the people in future generations as eternal and inviolate. It's a pretty strong language, isn't it? So. Again, maybe people, a few people here should actually read their own constitutions. But I'm just saying, I'm not trying to make things up. This is just an academic exercise. Where do these things come from? 
and they're all there in black and white. Yes. It is, it is, you're right, but at the same time, 1947, the, the UN, UN had just been set up, the preamble to the UN set out human rights, the UDHR was being signed at the same time. So where else do you find fundamental human rights? You look in there, you can go beyond it, back to French philosophers and so forth, but it is well accepted by the vast majority of people in the world is that that's where it all comes from and those fundamental rights have been, rec have been recorded in the UEDHR, the ICCPR and so forth, which Japan is also a signatory to. So that's just the logic of it. I'm just telling you academically where it comes from. Yes. And even in Asia, although this is not widely signed, but the Bangkok Declaration by a wide group of Asian states I think including Japan, certainly all ASEAN countries, principles of the Charter, the UDHR, and uh, the full realisation of all human rights throughout the world. So it's, I agree, not a strongly observed declaration, but certainly there has been consensus at many times throughout Asia. Okay, let's move from the, uh, to the human security side of things. We want to look, I want to look quickly, and Sato Sensei may assist me with this, at these concepts. We've talked about human dignity. We've talked about human rights. We've talked about, well, we haven't talked, we're talking now about human security, which was a concept that sort of grew up in the early 90s, somewhat in parallel, as we heard from this morning, those of us who heard the, the representative from the UNHCR here, Dirk Hebedecker. We were struggling a little bit to define it well, but it is a concept that Japan has been very wed to, as is many of you involved in human security classes here. And R2P, you probably heard of, which was what the, the uh, one of the high commissioners, sorry, one of the uh, secretary generals of the um, UN came out, the right to protection, that's all that means, um, and refugee rights and obligations and all uh, so these are all part of a package that overlap and interact with each other. So the recognised obligations of states to provide that protection and security is where people who don't get that, that's where surrogate protection comes in. So a state and its arrangements or contracts or whatever you like to put it with its citizenry, with its citizens, should be providing you with this basic security, including which includes, I would say, human rights as part of it, or at least at the human security level. Okay, so that's now. There's an article by a famous um, judge from here, Justice uh, Owada, who was uh, on the International Court in The Hague till very recently. And it's a very good explanation, far better than I would ever do, of human security and international law. So I think it's been sent out to you, hasn't it? Yes, I think to everybody. Or those, oh, for those of you who haven't, we'll deal with that in a moment. But, um, and please read that through. I think he explains it very well. And it will just, it will paint the whole picture of security, human rights, human dignity, and that whole background picture of international law and the, the uh, building stones and the blocks that it's built on to you very well. Sorry, I've got a question there. Uh, how do you define human, uh, human dignity and how it's possible to protect it by the law? That's, yep, that's, uh, that's what we're going to look at. In the detail, in the detail of the... Um, of the, 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 the Refugee Convention, which we'll come on to, is a term called a well-founded fear of being persecuted. And so much of what is in being persecuted comes down to human dignity, that every human being has the right to dignity. And in fact, just as an aside, and having been a judge in this area for... 25 years before I retired, two or three years ago. Uh, I can't 
tell you the number, maybe 10,000 cases I was involved in over all that time. And you do have many people who you have before you, and the vast majority, in my experience, and all the other judges I've spoken to, come before you and deserve, all of them deserve to be treated with human dignity. Even I sat on a terrorist court in London with some of the nastiest terrorists around in the days of Al-Qaeda and so forth came before us and we always gave them human respect, human dignity. Why do you think we did that as judges? Because they deserve them. Yeah, why else? Uh, yes, because they born as human, they deserve. Yes, yes, they deserve it. But also, if we, for example, if we on the court, and we often had cases in London, where evidence coming before us from states, often, was obtained by torture, uh, which we call torture-tainted evidence. And if that came before us, we almost universally would not accept it. Because what happens? We're not expressing that person's dignity because they were tortured. And not only that, we're lowering ourselves to below the level of human dignity by doing that. It's exactly why. So in some ways, the more abusive they are to you, the more dignity you should give them. All right? It's an interesting concept. And sometimes you might be biting your tongue. And I've seen, and a lot of judges or people over the years, particularly new to it, come into the chambers afterwards. You know, I could cut his throat type of thing. Just calm down. Charm will get you everywhere and respect his dignity or her dignity. So it's, that's the concept to this. And if you think about it also, just starting on the refugee thing, when you think about it, a lot of refugees are not the most desirable people as individuals. Why do you think that's logical? What do you think? In their own country. In their own country. They might not be desirable people and they may not be desirable people from your interaction with them. Mm. Uh, uh, may I make a point clearly? Yeah, yeah, go on. Clearly, I, um, uh, I want to uh, listen again. Okay, sorry. Topic. It might be a too complex a question, I'm sorry, uh, with the, the language. What I'm saying is that many refugees who appear before you may be, you think, as people they are rude, they are not respectful. They will, as I said, some of the ones who are pretty nasty terrorists and so forth will swear at you, don't respect the court, all these things. They, and so, but they still might be refugees. So that's why I say a lot of them are not people you would think are refugees. But, and they are undesirable in their own country on a lot of reasons. So, but why do you think that they would, you know, you get such people as refugees? Um, so you mean that they, they, even they, they are not persecuted by the country or the state, they, they can be refugees, so that's why? No, no, sorry, I'll explain it to you. It's probably a bit of a complex one, I apologise. So basically, you may have people come before you uh, who are pretty undesirable as people, bad characters, and... But when you think about it, they may be, we call in English, the tall poppies anyway. The people who stand out. The people that everybody doesn't like very much. <laughs> or they represent groups that are not very desirable. But they have the right to, in a democracy and countries, to say, have their own say. And some of the things they might say, like you get these racists and so forth may say, uh, and go on about, they may say things that are completely abhorrent to you and the way you behave. All the more reason, in some ways, that their risk of being persecuted when they go back is higher than the meek, mild person who may just be unfortunately in the wrong place at the wrong time. So when you are granting refugee status or going through it, 
you should not be embarrassed that this is not somebody who would you put at the top of your migration list. As I said at the start, this is not migration law. This is protection law. So it's logical that some pretty highly undesirable people you will grant refugee status to. So do you think that's a nice thing or not? It's almost like uh, that you are coming from abusive family environment because refugees are treated as very often by yes. abusive environment. Like yeah, it, you're quite right. There may be other reasons behind it, like they come from abusive family relationships, all sorts of other things. It may be just they're just nasty. That doesn't mean they're not a refugee. No, that's, that's, that's the, the point. The, the, the way they behave. Exactly. Some of yeah. And their behaviour against their fellow citizens is what brings them to the, be the tall poppy. So can you see what's going on here? You've got to turn your mind around. And if you're a lawyer, any of you lawyers here? No lawyers. My God, I'm on my own, apart from him. Uh, <laughs> as a lawyer, you learn... You're a lawyer. Come on, you didn't put your hand up. Uh, <laughs> you're qualified in law. My apology. <laughs> you learn, one of the things is the law of evidence. What evidence can I accept and what I can't and how I treat it. So my first, one of the first tutors I had as a lawyer, had practiced, done court cases and all those sort of things. What's the first thing he said you do with the law of evidence? And he would bring the book the law of evidence, you turn it upside down because the evidence you're going to get here is totally different and it'll be totally different to domestic law uh, because in domestic law you've got all these people. Ah, you can come and appear before me, I can cross-examine you, I can get all the information. Not so easy to do when you're running away from Idi Amin or who it might, might have been in the past. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so the UN, even in 2012, the UN brought through, again, another resolution, recognised the development of human rights and peace and security are the three pillars, pillars that the UN, that the UN uh, is built on. So to a degree that answers your point. This is the whole concept of dignity, development, peace and security are the pillars which the UN is all about. Yep, the next one. That's a resolution they parted in 2012, not that long ago. You'll get a copy of this, by the way. You don't have to photograph it if you want to see. It's, you'll, we'll get a copy each to you. Okay, to light to freedom, poverty. The same thing being repeated, really, that we've heard in those previous ones. Okay. All this so, at this point, what I often think is, with all that international consensus, is it correct and logical to say that the, these are the fundamental norms of human dignity, security, etc., we all want, we all aspire to, and we all live by? So is there anybody who doesn't want to live with those? Any of you that don't like that way of being treated? Individual rights being respected? Do you think... The guy over here in Russia, Putin, how does he want to live his life? He wants, does he want to live by all those norms? He doesn't. You bet he does. He wants them. Does every Russian want those? You ever come across one that doesn't? Unless they're so suppressed or brainwashed that they can't. You find it, anybody in the next one down? Mr. Chi and all his people, do they want to live by them? They'll tell you they do. They might not actually do it. See, these are the norms we all want to live by. So you think it's pretty self-evident. I can't think anybody, if you ask them individually, I've never had, in the 10,000 cases I've had, I know I don't want those rights. I don't want to be protected in that way. I'd rather be locked up somewhere and just told to do my job every day and had no rights, effectively slavery. Haven't seen too many volunteer slaves around the world. And 
haven't seen too many people we used to see in Europe, in London quite a lot, women who'd been, who'd been traded in there for prostitution and so forth. The, last thing, the first thing they wanted was to get, get the hell out of that situation. So it's, they want to come back to their core rights. Okay, next one. So, what I'm saying is logically we might, we should, we must turn to these essentials from international law and practice to give us the vital reference points for doing refugee assessment and complementary protection. What I mean by that is people who still need protection but are outside or beyond, without, as we say in English, without the uh, refugee protection itself, such as those who come under the um, CAT uh, or under the Convention Against Torture, but not for a convention reason, those who may be protected under the Articles 6 and 7 of the ICCPR, which we'll talk about later. Okay. And perhaps a little cynically, because having been around a long time, I'm allowed to be a bit cynical, uh, without taking any political stance, and it's a very good point while we're here, all of this refugee protection, surrogate protection, is apolitical. Do you understand what that means? There's no political view in it whatsoever. You are, n you are not insulting another country by recognising a refugee from that place. It is a totally personal decision on their own predicament. And so it is not an insult. Other countries take it as an insult sometimes, but the reality is it is a rule of law which most of them have already signed anyway, and what's the current title, about 150 countries have, and the rest probably are bound by customary international law anyway. So, so why presently, as I spoke about Mr Trump and others before, is this being ignored, ridiculed, blatantly flouted, and so many people vote for it? I don't have an answer, it just is... It's a genuine mystery to me <laughs> as to why you want all these things, but you say, oh no, but he can't have them. But I must have them at his expense. All these things, it just doesn't add up. Anyway, sorry. And you can see why, particularly as a former judge, sworn to uphold the rule of law, as all the judges I've ever come across want to do, want to come back to the opening comments we were making as students of human security and law, to think about, let's think about these questions as we do the whole course. And the first one is, is there a correct balance between these universal norms of international law with the links we've been talking about, human rights, dignity, etc., and growing nationalism or populist closed border approaches to refugee and migrant issues? It's all right, I'm not going to ask you individually to give the, <laughs> to give the answer now, but it is a real contingency. And then the second one is, if not, why not? It seems to me that there's a major disconnect going here in the world, and or maybe I'm wrong, and many people don't want to live by those norms uh, and find um, the rights, human rights, rule of law and solutions to problems. They don't. They find it repugnant. Well, I've never met one, and it just seems amazing to me that this this populist uh, approach, nationalistic approach, can say I'd rather beggar or kill my neighbour than I would, uh, at my expense, than uh, have them all live in some form of e equality and human dignity. So it's it's problematic. And for younger people, I think it, it's, it's a real conundrum, a real problem for them, along with other big issues like climate change and so forth, that you as young people will have to look at. And I don't really think, as somebody from the more senior variety, well past the silver age almost, the old age, I don't think it was caused by my generation because they wrote these things in the 70s and 60s and, and 40s after the terrible lessons of the first 50 years of this century. 
And if they're slipping away, maybe it needs leaders, leaders like people sitting in this course or do this sort of work in Satasan says uh, course to lead and to say, no, let's come back to the basics we really want to live by and give respect to everybody. It's a small world with too many people on it, but we'll achieve things if we work together, not tear each other apart. Anyway, I've had my philosophy. <laughs> if there's, is there any, any comments on that, please make them. But uh, it's really just to think about as we're doing this sort of work. So we've, uh, at minimum, we can agree we should endeavour to find a workable balance. Uh, and with this essential background, we can move on and we can look at the, the appropriate application of IHRL, that's International Human Rights Law, uh, to refugee law and protected, and hello, I've made an error there, and complementary protection, not proof. Okay. Next one. Right. We've got, uh, before I move into applying the human rights framework to, to refugee law, is there anything in that whole background situation you've got issues or questions about? All right, you've all done a lot of thinking. <laughs> I wanted to really get your thinking in the whole framework of it. That's all not to scare you off or anything like that. It's just to get, because unless, again, so many of these things, and sadly, it comes when uh, training and jobs such as uh, immigration, um, some of them are officers who have correctly the role as border protection people, forget there's two sides to it. That it's not just border protection, it comes with obligations that states have signed up for. And to keep this human dignity, this human security side of it, uh, the human rights side of it going, you've got to keep everything in balance. And that's why I use the word balance. And that's why when you see the pictures, uh, sorry, you see the statues, used to be on the top of the building next door to where I worked in London. She's standing like this. It's all about balance. And it's always about the balance and hearing the other side and dealing with the other side. There are two sides, or more than that mostly, but at least two sides to every story. And so that's why the pillars of justice, and you see them pretty much in every country around the world, don't you? It's, uh, it's certainly, and on the uh, Immigration Judges Association that I'm involved with, uh, it's one of its symbols as well. Okay. <laughs> well, just uh, my music question, and I also comment uh, to you that you said balance. Yep. Yes, every time the balance is important, but uh, how to strike a balance? It depends on the state or, you know, Japan, as you know, they're very strict for the application of the uh, so-called refugee convention, especially determination of refugee status for the interpretation or some kind of a uh, credibility level or so on. In comparison with species, uh, your country is uh, New Zealand and so on. Maybe your state is a sort of a uh, migrant state. Japan is not uh, uh, such a historical background, so different. So the nationalism is based on such a kind of a different histories and different sort of a context in such a way. How do you think the balance you're talking about? Uh, well, unfortunately, the, the world is now the still, still the nation state system. We have uh, international law, but uh, state is uh, uh, supreme under international law. Of course, we are obliged to the convention, convention or treaties. But the, this sort of interpretation is also based on the, each state. Of course, we have ICJ, this, you know, the Justice Owada, <laughs> the kind of a person to actually for uh, such authority to decide uh, international legal disputes uh, between the state nations. Because both nations equal, in this sense, you know, the someone have to decide which is right, which is wrong. But still, the ICJ is not superior to the state. No. The state just ignore this kind of a decision. 
E3, even if we call it uh, binding. But uh, you know, this is a reality. Yes. This is the reality of the world. Yep. So in this sense, this uh, refugee paradigm <laughs> regime is also challenging this reality. So my question is uh, how to strike a balance and who is responsible, who are also, uh, authorized for this kind of uh, this, this world. This is a fundamental sort of uh, uh, comments on the questions. <laughs> Anybody want to add to that? <laughs> well, it's, it's an yes, excellent yes, question, of course. Yes. Yep. Well, let me answer your question and a little bit of... Uh, right, well, one of the first guarantees of that should be the judiciary. That's what you're there for, to uphold the rule of law. And the rule of law is, as judges, pretty well what we've been writing here, international rule of law not just your domestic rule of law, because, as you remember, we look back at the Japanese constitution. It writes all these things which are pretty much international law on the same topics. We all looked at this whole background of human dignity, human security, human rights, and we all agree or felt, yeah, that's what we all want. So if you're going to be a judge upholding that, that's what you should be doing. And if officials in your country are not doing that, you should tell them, no, you should not be doing that. That's what I'm here. And you've got to be brave as a judge. The first thing, don't just say, I'm going, I'll go along with it. That's why you have judges. That's one of the main jobs for, ju for the judiciary is to be strong. I know a lot of them aren't, but that's why you have an appeal system to go to higher ones, you see. Anyway, sorry. My answer to that, so do I want to know. <laughs> uh, just to be serious for a minute, I don't think, I think a lot of the problem is it's simply not taught. Is there a, there's an international law at Hongo, I think. I think I've been told that the number of universities that teach international law, seriously, you could almost count on one hand. All right, that means maybe there's not a demand, but surely those universities, as this university is doing to a degree, should be a little bit bold and say, we want to be in Japan a major international citizen and uphold all these rules and uphold international law for our own dignity and for our own constitution. And so therefore judges should stand up and be counted, as we say. And around the world, you see some of them, amazing judges. You know, Justice Awada said a lot of very, all right, he may not have been a judge here, but he was a, uh, what is it, senior um, bureaucrat, wasn't he, before he, um, so, but he's done that and been brave enough to say it. You've had uh, Madame Ogata, who was the High Commissioner for Refugees, so it's not, there's not Japanese people around who, who can do it. It's been there, and uh, let's hope it continues. So that's what happens. And um, in my countries, there are, there are judges who, who don't act that way. In the UK, the highest courts there are very brave. And ex I have to say, the standard there is superb. If you want to hear such a judgment, it takes about nine minutes. You just heard it the other day. If you watched on the BBC News, the Brexit, well, it's not a Brexit case, it's the prorogation case in which the Supreme Court unanimously stood together, 11 of them, and uh, Baroness Hale, who I've met, is in fact a member of the International Association of Refugee and Migrant Judges. Um, just said, we're going to tell you what we think a thousand years of history in the, in the UK means. And so they did, even though the government still saying, oh no, it was illegal. So that's what the bravery of being a judge is all about. And that's what you have the rule of law for. Because really, God help us, when the judges... You can look, even in the US, sorry to be any American citizens, um, well, any non-Trump voters. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, they, 
that's the weakness, if there is anything, that you get somebody who's perhaps a little off the rails, like Trump, and he starts appointing his own judges to write what he wants, like he's done with the Attorney General. He didn't get what he wanted, so he keeps firing them till he finds one that does as he's told. That's what uh, Putin's doing all the time. You don't like him, you fire them. So you get judges who are just political. They're not good judges at all. And so that's when the public and what you're saying start to lose their protection because the judiciary is not doing its job. No perfect answer, but it's a very good question. Yeah, thank you very much. That's okay, a very shall good we take question. a um, yes, go on. maybe this is we should <laughs> think over yeah. the break.